Hello, everyone, and welcome to Equality Leaders Black History Month panel. I'm your host, Zara Odewile. My pronouns are she, they, and I'm so excited to be here with you today. Well, Black history is all too often one that is solely centered around the trauma of Black lives. Whilst it is wholly important to acknowledge and understand this history, it is often the only narrative that is told. Presenting the idea that this is the only origin story worth remembering. At Equality Leaders, we're interested in digging into the plurifera of Black histories that exist, but have been far too long or erased from the annals of history. These Black histories tell us stories of Black brilliance, of innovation, culture, identity, community, joy, and belonging. Today, we want to redress our knowledge gaps and bring to light some of the stories whilst recognizing why they have been lost. I'm joined by an incredible set of individuals, all with stories to tell, and I cannot wait to get speaking to them now. So let's bring them on stage. Hi everyone, welcome, welcome. How are you guys? Good. Doing well. Really well. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Well, let's kick off with some introductions. Um, first, I'd like to introduce everyone to Oliver St. Clair Franklin, Honorary British Council and Advisory Board at NatWest Bank. What brings you here today, Oliver, and what histories are you keen to have better told? Well, first, I want to thank you for having me on this panel because this is a conversation of the Black Atlantic. And I think as Black people, we need to understand the international nature of our heritage and also our legacy. What brought me here was I was fortunate enough to be a part of the civil rights movement in America in the 1960s. I'd been in demonstrations since 13. I've seen the progress, but even with the progress, there's a lot to learn because what we must celebrate is the lived experiences of Black people. And that trauma is a part of it, but also Black joy is a great part of it. And I'm hoping today we can begin to explore more about Black joy. Incredible. Thank you so much, Oliver. It's great to have you on the panel here today. Let me turn to Kamali Scott-Jones, artist and repertoire director for AWAL and co-founder of the Black Music Coalition. Hi, Kamali. Same question to you. What brings you here today and what histories are you keen to have better told? I am also really happy to be here, just like Oliver. Um, it's a really great space and hopefully we can have a really interesting conversation. Um, for me, I think I'm just passionate in my day to day um, about making sure that Black voices are heard, Black artists, which, you know, is an area, an issue that they've gone long overlooked in lots of different ways. Um, and yeah, for me, in the small ways that I can in my day to day, um, in a &R here at AWOL and otherwise um, through the Black Music Coalition, I think it's just really important to elevate and amplify the voices of others who haven't quite yet found their voice yet. Incredible. Um, giving people voices is something that's a really powerful piece and to do that in the industry you're in. I'm so excited for us to dig deeper. So thank you so much for coming on stage today. Mark Lopez, Lomas, Mark Lomas, Chartered FCIPD, Head of Culture at Lloyd's. Um, welcome. Uh, please tell us what histories are you keen to have better told? What brings you here today, Mark? Great, thank you. Um, yes, I think what's brought me here today is a, a real interest in, in how kind of the stories and narratives around Black history has evolved, and particularly how they're how they're taught. What is and isn't isn't known. And um, as some people listening may know, Lloyd is uh, currently uh, undertaking research into thrall in transatlantic slavery, and that research launches in no, on November the eighth. So. I thought it was an excellent uh, opportunity to talk about all the progress and the positives that we see coming out of our communities and how we how we address some of those challenges going forward. So, so thank you for having me. 
It's, it's, it's great to have you here and to be telling that story. All right, then we have Kashane David and Danielle David, the founders of Cremanti Rum. David, I'll turn, kick Kashane, I'll turn to you first. Um, <laughs> um, and Danielle as well, please also let us know what brings you here today and what histories are you keen to have better told? Well, thank you for the invitation, and it's great to be here um, as Cremanti Rum, but also as, just as a family. Uh, it's a really nice uh, feeling to be part of this. Um, my, um, my particular interest was very much about seeing how a lot of the stories that I grew up with that were centered and carried through our experience and interaction with rum and sugar have been deleted. And that's what uh, certainly my aspect, my my interest uh, in Kermanti is actually about telling and retelling those stories so that they last from one generation to another. Yeah, and for me, um, I think the I, I spent a long time um, working in the commercial shipping industry, um, and it was a similar um, feeling of um, you know a lack of inclusion, a lack of um, being a part of the that that wider community, and, and understanding that I had a very different history to to people I was working with. Um, I think from BLM um, and and uh, the murder of George, George Floyd, um, there was a big. Uh, movement towards self-determination and I think that's what we're trying to do with um, Cremanti. Um, the more self-determined you are, the easier it is to invite your community to that table um, and I think that's definitely a mission that, that we're on um, and you know thanks for having us here so that we can discuss it. Thank you. Thank you so much Dari. Thank you Kashane. I think um, the idea of being able to rely on ourselves as a community um, is a really powerful one. And I think you spoke about the murder of George Floyd just briefly there. And I think that was something that for me was a really poignant point where I've read stories of activists and moments of change and moments that have driven um, movement, um, but really living through one that was an experience that everyone in the world was really um, in that moment together, especially because of what was going through from a health standpoint with COVID. And it definitely is a point of inspiration in my history for the work that I do today. And that's what I'm really interested in, those stories that have inspired us. But sometimes those stories needn't be ones of trauma. So first and foremost, um, to the panel, I'm really interested in understanding what in your personal histories has inspired how you move today. Kamali, can I start with you? Yeah, sure. Obviously, it's a big question. And I think, um, yeah, just a caveat, I don't think we've got enough time to really get into the nitty gritty. But for me, I've grown up around music. Both my parents have always worked in and around it. And I think I probably took for granted how much that affected me. And I kind of started out after uni um, in fashion and I thought, oh, I'm a fashion girl, not a music girl. And I did that for a while, but I, I, I had the bug already. And um, just being exposed to, you know, how the business works and, and all those skills that you kind of subconsciously pick up, I think is a massive part of my journey and why I'm here and so passionate about music and I'm definitely more passionate about music and artists and the industry itself um because yeah it's it, it's problematic at, at, at times um but yeah as I said in my intro I think for me you really you know are able to see up close especially in the time I would say in the UK probably from 2017 in particular we had a real spike in um the popularity of black artists and black music in the mainstream which was amazing and you know, it's been a real roller coaster ride, and we've had a lot of fun, lots of highs and lows, which is, you know, sort of par for the course in this game. But I think what I have realized is how much as a people we over index in that space, despite us being such a minority in the UK. And although we do have this massive impact on all of culture, where, whether it's slang, when you get, you know, your marketing emails from ASOS or 
Xbox or JD Sports or wherever it is, um, you know, you can hear our dialect that's, you know, been adopted by the mainstream, which is amazing on one hand, but we know that we don't always reap the rewards of that. Um, and I think it's the same for music. And so for me, it's just been a real eye opener as I've gone on my journey to just really try to advocate and and continue to to lift up those artists and make sure that they are educated enough and empowered enough to make financially sound decisions and good business decisions, um, especially as for a lot of them in this generation, many of them haven't, you know, seen the types of money that they get from a recording advance, for example. And if you give that to someone who has no real financial literacy and they're like 19, there's lots of problems that can follow. And yeah, I think it's about doing our due diligence um, as executives in, in the music industry to make sure that we're looking out for those people and making sure that ultimately they are looked after because if they're not, it kind of affects the bottom line. And I, mm -hmm. and I have experienced black artists maybe being sidelined and that's mm -hmm. not as important. Um, and that's something that I feel just has to change if we want to see, you know, this side of the business really grow and I guess mimic our, you know, counterparts in the US who I would say are probably 15, 20 years behind us. I'm sorry, ahead of us in terms of development and sort of infrastructure of their business and um, mm -hmm. how they've been empowered to really plow on with that. So for mm -hmm. me, I would say that's my main um, motivator. Mm -hmm. and, and a huge motivator it is I think to see the evidence of knowing that what can be created and the influence it can have um, on society on brands and businesses but also then want to ensure that those people and those voices are protected is a really powerful motivation and a, um, and a, a great story um, so thank you for sharing that Kamali I'll turn to, to you, Kashane, um, um, and move from music to, to alcohol, to rum specifically. Um, do you have similarities in what, in what personal histories have really inspired your movement? How long has rum featured in, in your life? No, that's a, that, it's, it's a great question. Um, I guess there are two main influences that led me to where I am, and one is... Um, growing up in a very religious household where we never drank any alcohol, but there was always rum in the house and there was always uh, rum appearing at these life events when somebody was born, when somebody died, when somebody got married, when somebody was being remembered after they had passed on. And it was something that I understood rum in that way. So it wasn't about drinking it. And um, I was really fascinated by by the social significance, the social and spiritual significance of rum. And so when I was, when I got older and I spent uh, the last 25 years uh, uh, building and running service, uh, mental health services for the black community, I really understood in a very practical way how people's uh, sense of themselves, their identity, their heritage and culture is really important as a bedroom for mental well-being. And so a lot of what I became interested in, it consolidated into this rum story that I'm so keen to, to talk about within the rum world because it's missing. The, 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 the gaze, the, the focus has been very much on those people who benefited from rum rather mm. than those people who were involved in making it and sustaining it. And there's a whole story about what rum means to people from within our communities that I think is the one that I'm very keen to tell. It's really um, powerful to think about, as you said there, not who's benefited from, but who really had, had the hand in, in, in bringing it to us. Um, and those are the stories that we seem to be missing out on. I guess I'd love to turn to Danielle and to see if um, for Kashane, Kashane is your father, um, and he spoke about having rum in his house and it not being a, 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 an environment where alcohol was even had, but rum still existed there. Was that a similar story for you? Is that different? How did rum feature in your life and kind of how did that move to you working so closely with your father now? So it's interesting because I've always as well been around rum. Um, you know, any Caribbean household, 
you generally find rum in the cupboard. Um, but my, I, I have a really special experience with it because I have been lucky enough to um, travel back to the Caribbean very often um, and as a kid as well. So one of the t traditions that we had um, whenever we'd land, specifically in Dominica, because that's where my, my grandfather was, moved back to when I was five, we would, as a family, land and then stop off at rum shops on the way back to his house. So obviously, as kids, we didn't sit by the bar and drink, but we witnessed it. And it was all really special because this, the, the story that I had of rum was of rum shacks, you know, rickety wooden shelves with all these unlabeled bottles on the back with, you know, infusions and, and all kinds of stuff. And then th there'd be someone serving up my granddad, my dad, my mom and whoever. Um, and th that's the experience I have of it, um, you know, and I think one of the, the reasons that that I wanted to join my dad last year uh, and actually grow this company was um, because we I, I sort of realized that that this kind of dies with me. All of this knowledge that my granddad passed on to me, um, you know, which he did, and um, it, it kind of ends with me if, if I don't do something about it. Um, you know, so uh, that that's my mission. That's that's what I want to do. I, you know, I want to bring that story to, to the masses and um, make sure that the next generation continues with all of this knowledge that our ancestors gave us. Um, you know, especially when it comes to the, the medicinal benefits. <laughs> and I think I'd love to like um, touch on that in a little bit as well, because what I'm hearing is there's this sense of um, community um, and family and ancestry is really powerful um, and an origin story of these histories. Like Kamali mentioned, um, music was always in her family and now we hear our rum was also always a part of yours. So there's a real um, powerful nature of the, the role of family in bringing these things through our histories. Um, which I think I can really relate to, um, especially from the sense of food um, and the things that were in our home and what was on the kitchen table and so on and so forth. Okay, so we've touched on some really positive um, stories and memories that we have um, from, from some of our wonderful panelists here. I want to turn to um, Mark and Oliver to speak a little bit more about some of the industries that you find yourselves in, because, of course, there are um, a positive impact that Black history has had um, in these spaces. But of course, some industries, um, as we've already been touching on, have benefited from Black communities. Um, how useful is it to, to reference those stories and bring them to the forefront today? Mark, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to you from, from the industry that you find yourself in. Great, thank you. Um, uh, I think it's very, I think it's very important um, and for, uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, uh, when you're looking to, uh, when you're looking to attract talent from diverse communities as, as kind of the insurance uh, industry is, is now, um, it's very important to be transparent. And to have looked at that and looked at your your history, your your involvement, the, the positives and the negatives, because uh, otherwise um, your rhetoric is a bit detached from the reality of of what the community sees. And even if that understanding the community is not fulsome, um, uh, there will be a defined uh, view or understanding of, of your brand, a perception of your sector. And then there's the reality of all the wonderful contributions that diverse communities have, have bought into uh, bought into the sectors. And we just celebrated at, at Lloyd's, the, the, the first black broker was in the Lloyd's market in 1978. Um, and still, still, uh, still is there to today, um, uh, working as a, as a CEO. And these things are, um, these things are very important, not only as milestones, uh, but to understand from that first person, now, uh, you know, 12 odd percent of the entire market are, are black and ethnically diverse individuals. So progress is happening. Now, whether it's happening fast enough, that's, 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 a, that's a good debate to have. If you sit where I sit, right, you'd probably say, no, it's not happening fast enough. 
um, if you were in the room with the first black broker, you're probably saying, well, that's a lot of change that's happened. So I think, um, you know, I, th I think it's very, very important for organizations to be clear that, you know, I think after George Floyd, the, um, the expectation is that your rhetoric is more aligned to your reality. Uh, and if you haven't dealt with the transparency of your reality, um, then it's very difficult to, to move forward in a way that is meaningful. Uh, and so for me, that's, that's very important. Oh, Oliver, you are on mute. Am I? Yes. There we go. <laughs> Am I okay now? Yes. I think, uh, I th I think Mark is uh, right on, as we say here, spot on, as you all say, across the pond. Uh, quick thing about George Floyd. It's been mentioned, and I'm happy. It takes nine minutes and 32 seconds to hang someone. So when you lynch a person or hang a person, it's about nine minutes and they're dead. That policeman had his neck, his knee on George Floyd for nine minutes and 32 seconds. So what we witnessed was a lynching. And that's why it had such resonance considering the lynching history of black people in the United States of America. So it did spark a worldwide reaction because people saw for the first time a lynching. It wasn't a rope, it was a neck, but it was the same process. So I'm happy um, that uh, we mentioned a uh, George Floyd. Next, I wanna talk about talent and particularly in our industry. Yesterday was a Sunday is American football. Uh, and when you look on the field, 90% of the players are black. All right, because they have the talent and there are no barriers. They train and they get it. And then when you go up the corporate ladder, you see less and less black people. So when you look in the owner's box, you'll see non-black people, or if you see black people, they are stars in the sports world. But you can be sure that none of them have a stake in the business and the challenge with the business is it becomes closed off. Once you talk about money, it gets real quiet because people are very protective of money and what money does um, in our society. So Lloyd's Bank, Nat West is, is moving in, in the same direction to reach out and really look for talented people. And I sit on the advisory board uh, at NatWest, and I'm amazed at the amount of Black talent uh, we see coming through NatWest. But it's not enough just to attract talent. That talent, as Mark says, has to be nurtured. It has to have a goal. I insist that when talented people come in, their managers sit down and say, here's a career path. So by year two, that person understands where they are to build their career. And then these networks, I mean, Britain is, um, you know, I love Britain and I love the people in Britain, but some of these networks are so closed off to people. Um, I go to places in Britain, I guess to, in America too, where I'm the only person of color in the room. And I look around and say, my goodness, these folks need to know talented black people. So part of my strategy when I'm the only black person in the room is to try to get two sympathetic people there and create the process of introducing them around to people of talent. And I think if we do that and we make a commitment to do that, we can see the financial, uh, the financial industry become more diverse. But it is a tough fight because people protect money. And so we need to be very clear about that. But I think Britain is, I mean, Lloyd's, Nat West, when I travel around, I think you all are making great, great strides in, in financial services. Thank you, Oliver. I think there's, there's something really interesting on the piece of talent, black talent, talent. specifically. Yep. 
versus the 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 power and the financial piece. And I think even um, Kamali, when you were speaking about the music industry, this is something um, that you were touching on. Um, can I invite you to kind of double tap on that from from a music perspective, and in your role, kind of supporting talent, how we're working to kind of ensure that the financial financials are matching up to that, and the behind the scenes matches up to what we are being presented with. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting point. Um, there was a few that you made there, Oliver. So that was really. Um... I don't want to derail the conversation too much though, so I'll stick to your question. Um, but I think it's really difficult the way that the, certainly the major label industry is set up, which is the core of it and the mainstream artists that we all know and love most likely have been through that route in the last 50, 60 plus years. Um, and I do think it is set up in a really uh, exploitative way. That That is how it's been built and that is how it thrives. Um, and it's going to take some more time to really unpick that and get it to a more equitable place. But I think, um, yeah, I spent about six years in major label in the major label system, um, which has its. You know, I'm not here to knock it. I think everyone has their own path, and and there's more than one way to to get there. But for me, I think it's too punitive, and the more that you learn and you kind of see the outcomes and also as the business kind of evolves in this time of technology, TikTok, all these things, the, I guess the guarantee that a major label used to provide to a, a, an aspiring artist was the hit rate for success felt more tangible, higher. Mm -hmm. um, and I think now we're in a bit of a state of flux. And so just mm -hmm. because you get signed to a major label, with a nice big recording budget and marketing budget doesn't actually mean you're gonna be successful. And we are in a, we're kind of at the mercy of the algorithm and all right. these things. And so, and I, and I think that's really difficult, but that being said, um, AWOL where I work now um, is actually an independent um, distribution artist label, artist and label services company. So we're, we move very much like a record label um, you know, lots of us have had that major label training, so to speak, and that experience. But the artists that we sign here are, they own the majority of their rights. Um, it's never more than 50-50, most of the time, maybe 70, 30, 60, 40, you know, all negotiable. Um, but for me, it's been a real breath of fresh air. Just, it changes the dynamic between you and the artists and their team. It doesn't feel like an us versus them thing, which I think, you know, in, in Oliver's example of the athletes, I think it, you know, we've seen time and time again, the penny sort of drops and it changes how, you know, they show up on the court or on the field. And in in our case, I think it does definitely happen um, in music where they feel like they're being you know, ripped off or, and it completely changes, you know, the type of artist that shows up to set that day or to the studio that day. And so I think, again, kind of back to my original point, I think it really does ultimately affect the bottom line. And interestingly, Oliver, what you mentioned about people protecting money. Um, and I think I would even go further to say, I think other maybe demographics understand that protecting the money also equates to protecting their legacy and their sort of, you know, lineage. And that's something that purposefully historically has been taken away from, from black people the world over. And I think that's part of something that we need to retrain our, our minds on and to really understand what that means and what that looks like and why it's important. I think in music, that conversation has, um, definitely revolved around the owning of your masters. And so most recently Diddy, for example, keeps, um, not keeps, he recently um, said that he was giving the master rights back to some of the artists that have been on Bad Boy for the last 25 years. For the untrained eye, it seems like, oh my God, Diddy's so, you know, wow, what a great guy. For most people that maybe have worked in music, it's like, oh yeah, great marketing for your new album. But regardless, the, the worth of those masters aren't what they were 20 years ago. He's made the money off those that needed to be made. And again, that's not to knock that system per se. I think it, 
I guess they absorb all the risk of all those artists that we've never heard of and they spent hundreds of thousands of pounds or dollars on. So there's arguments for both sides, right? But I think the the owning of the masters is where the conversation has got to. And it's a, it's a step in the right direction, but actually it's so much deeper than that. It's so much wider than that. And I think across all of our industries, I think that's kind of where we're at. We need to get to the next point in the conversation um, and really understand and identify what it really means and and what that means your kids, kids, kids can do with that fortune that you've amassed through your talents. And, and yeah, similar to what Danny said as well, it's like, you kind of can't help it. You, you just absorb this stuff. And then it's like, it's on you to kind of pay that forward. And I think for me, I see that being um, the next focus point for us as a, as a people. Um, and yeah, and just changing how things have been thus far. Thank you, Kamali. Um, I think there's so much in that. Um, you spoke about kind of the systems that actually we're trying to get around and how things have set up what that weren't initially set up. Um, so um, the black population could succeed. And so now as things shift and change, um, some of these feel really small and some of these feel bigger, but companies like yours and how they're looking to partner now, knowing that history um, is what is really powerful and what can move that dial. So it's great to really understand and deep dive into some of those stories. Um, I want to turn to Danielle and Shane and understand a little bit more about some of the stories that um, you're keen to have told. Um, we're, we're speaking a little bit about um, the spaces and I wondered if there were any, um, any individuals or communities that we need to know about that we don't currently know about that um, have had an impact in, in your space. Happy for you to go first, Danny. So I think um, I wanted to I wanted to go back to sort of my time in shipping um, uh, briefly because I think a, a thought that I had um, when both Oliver and Kamali were speaking was this feeling that I had, and, and twelve years I worked in the shipping industry, this feeling that I had of um, being part of a a, a club. Um, to which I was paying more in membership for than my white counterparts, right? Um, and I think there's a lot to be said about, again, sort of piggybacking off um, Oliver and Kamali's points, um, about ownership and ownership of stories and determining who owns those stories. And I think that also links to authenticity um, as well. And there was, there was one... Um, story that I sort of I say story a part of my history and our history um that sort of rang through throughout my head the whole time I was in shipping now whenever anybody mentioned the Panama Canal you know all the money that was going through the Panama Canal all the ships that were passing through the Panama Canal um all I could think of was the fact that my great-grandfather worked on that canal and that he narrowly escaped death you know four and a half thousand um West Indians uh, perished building that canal so there's a there's a there's something so um nuanced and and that keeps you kind of on the outside and it's that story it's that history um you know and i and i think that the more we talk about our stories the more we bring them to the forefront um the more we can tap into our own community and 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 bring um, bring a celebration in a, in a sense, a celebration of life um, and, and the fact that we're here and that we made it. Um, and, and then, you know, coming back to what I was saying earlier about self-determination and, and saying, hey, look, th these are my stories and I'm going to make sure they're going to be passed on um, and exposed in a way. Um, you know, we want the world to know them. Um, I think that does a lot for our communities. Um, and I say communities because blackness is not a monolith. We there is a, it's we are a wide, diverse peoples. Um, but with I'm gonna hark back to BLM again. I think something that really warmed my heart um, was 
the, the fact that we came in together, came together as, as a community, as a black community, but we started to really acknowledge the nuances and the different stories within that community. Um, and we wanted to listen to each other. And I think that's one of the, I, I guess my, my injection of joy, of black joy into this conversation is that we are talking more. And the more we do that, um, the more this global majority succeeds um, and, and pushes each other forward. So yeah, I think that's my, my take on it. That's wonderful. Yeah. I, I think um, um, th there's, there's a couple of things that, um, that I became passionate about in terms of stories. And essentially, um, a lot of my work in mental health was actually about, the way I describe it is about helping people to understand and own their own story so that they can really figure out who they are who their people are what's the what's the mission that they have during this lifetime and i think the um so in coming into contact with the trade of the rum world was really quite disconcerting because what i recognized um certainly at a, at a at a festival at a rum festival was suddenly getting that moment of looking around and not recognizing any of these stories. You know, when a company has a brand story, it says something about their mission, who they are, and what they want to do in the world. And I, and I remember I was really struck by standing and looking at many brand stories mm -hmm. that I just didn't recognize. A lot of the stories that I grew up with, you know, they had very... Um, very important social meetings, like the story of La Jablesse, who is the, the spirit woman who keeps, in a sense, keeps men uh, on the straight and narrow. And it was a story we grew up with. Now, that wasn't really some of the stories that I was seeing, but it's certainly a story that I owned. I, I, I knew as a child, it's something we, we grew up with. Uh, another example would be things like the the practice of pouring libations to honor the ancestors when you are before you are drinking rums and when you open a bottle of rum so there are many of these africanisms that really are, are quite important because they are the culture and the customs that make you who you are and give you a sense of a sense of self a sense of what's the story that i want to tell but also what are these these uh, these wisdoms and hidden meanings that are really important because they were crafted through struggle and through the joy of overcoming those struggles and finding meaning uh, amongst uh, amongst each other despite the difficult times that that you had. So when you're thinking for me, when I'm thinking about black joy, it's incredibly important that those stories are echoed and shared. And I think, listening to my colleagues around uh, uh, around this particular panel, it's really nice to hear that, that people are aware of these really joyful stories that may have come out of real difficult times, but the important thing is not to, to, uh, to experience pain, but what you learn as, as a result of it that keeps you and sustains you, and you can then pass on for that next generation. Incredible. Thank you so much, Kashane, and, and Danielle as well. That really a way that you've brought through joy in something which can be quite um, painful to see if you're not recognizing what you know is something that really belongs to your community and you're not seeing the stories that you personally know. And so you going on those journeys and um, whether that be kind of working in the shipping space and thinking that something needs to change here or actually saying there are better stories or stories that represent our community better that I'd like to be told um, and taking the steps to do that. I think that's really powerful. So I commend you both and thank you for sharing. Okay, so at this point, um, there are a couple more questions that I want to um, dive into. And I think as we're in Black History Month and we think about Black history, Already from our conversations, we've really been touching on this idea that it is in all of our history. Um, and there are so many things happening in that space. What often comes up during this period is uh, a question around 
not needing Black History Month because it is everyone's history. And I just wanted to pose that question to the panel. Um, maybe Mark, Oliver, I'll come to you first and understand um, what are your thoughts on this, on needing a Black history or not needing a Black history and how it relates to being everyone's history? Right. Um, good, good question. Um, so for, I, I kind of understand the sentiment of where it comes from. Why do we need a Black History Month? It's all our history. Uh, but I don't think we're there yet. So mm -hmm. um, when Black history, Black excellence and, and Black contributions are um, as embedded and woven through uh, history, through all the levels of education, I think at that point we can have a different conversation. But uh, presently that, that doesn't happen. And for me, Black History Month is a real opportunity to celebrate Black excellence, to celebrate uh, the achievements uh, of, of Black groups during, uh, during uh, our time here. And also to make sure that that contribution is recognized. And what always strikes me, I'm from Bermuda, so English Black history is a little different to my own, right? Um, what always strikes me is that um, there are wonderful contributions from all across all all walks of life all industries um you, you can't you can't come away from the fabric of the uk and think oh actually this hasn't had a huge contribution from uh from black and also other ethnically diverse communities as well um but that's why it's that's why it's needed and um you know if i just give my personal take on it um you know bermuda is a very small place right 21 miles long with 22 depending who you agree with and, and about a mile wide right um but growing up it was um was not unusual for me to see uh black politicians black doctors black lawyers black business owners etc uh that was normal right? But my understanding when I came to the UK was very different. You know, very rarely did I see senior black politicians. Very rarely did I see senior uh, black people in a, in a corporate in, environment. Um, and if I did see them, um, they probably were the one, or maybe the one or the, or the two. Um, and so that's why black history is really still necessary. And it, it might not be for those who know everything about their history, but there are plenty of people who don't. And uh, the, be it, you know, people used to talk when I was younger about being black and proud. Well, actually, Black History Month gives you a really great opportunity to feel black and proud. Right? Um, and so I think it's very important. And, and at the point at which um, our education system uh, does a better job of explaining uh, and referencing histories, uh, contributions and recognizing excellence, um, then we'll always need a, a Black History Month. Maybe one day we won't, but that, that day is not the day. Thank you. And Oliver? Yeah. I, <laughs> I think Mark was, uh, I mean, there's not much to add, uh, but I'll add just, just a little bit. I'm a 13th generation American. Um, I came here, my ancestors came here when it was British North America. Of the 12 million Africans who were taken from Africa to the New World, only 340,000 uh, came to British North America. So we were always in the minority. Most of you have ancestry in, fortunately, in countries where it was a Black majority, like Bermuda or Dominica or Jamaica or Nigeria, Ghana, but we were in the minority. And it wasn't until the 1970s that textbooks would include our history. And it, it was included in a cursory way. And so there's a big explosion in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 20s for African-American scholars who began to come on the scene to not only be scholarly, but to be community activists, to go out into the community and talk to people that weren't scholars about our history. The music, Stevie Wonder, these folks began to explore uh, black music. 
And I've got to thank the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. They came to America and opened up America to black blues musicians. And this was a very important part of the consciousness in America of the contribution of black people to American culture. And now the focus is on the economics, the contribution of enslaved Africans to the wealth of the United States. So this is the next phase. And my hope is that in 50 years or 25, whatever, we won't have the need for a Black History Month where we're focused on our history. But in the absence of the true story and the stories being a part of the national conversation, right? then we need to have a focus of a month where we can talk amongst ourselves and to the broader audience and begin to focus on our own stories. So I agree with Mark. In future, let's fight to not have a Black History Month. But to do that, we have a lot of work to do now to build and tell our own stories for ourselves and for the wider audience. Not now I'm on mute. Thank you, Oliver, and thank you, Mark. Um, I, I think you've, you've said a lot there about the power of having this space, um, many spaces like the one that we're creating now, to talk about it freely um, and to be given that space um, since it is still so minimal in many parts um, and so specific um, when it comes to the sort of histories that are shared um, growing up. I know for one that my the history that I learned was very much American and it was very much transatlantic slave trade. And even then it was a few lessons. Um, except for when we would have Black History Month and we would get to learn a little bit more in these spaces. That being said, what's becoming quite evident today, um, especially when we think about some of the movements that have been mentioned earlier, um, Danny, when you mentioned BLM, for example, highlighting Black history um, has become a political issue. There are anti-woke movements, there are ongoing suggestions that people are making it all about race. And this comes up when there are issues of today and you'll have maybe modern day activists, even for example, Kaleti Okafor most recently um, was called out for making a, a situation about race when she was bringing up the histories of how black women are treated um, in the medical world. And so I want to understand a little bit more about your thoughts on this and how we tackle the idea that black history is a political issue um, and that the spaces in which we're allowed to freely speak about it without coming under fire are coming into question. How do you guys overcome that in your own spaces? And what do you say to people who, who may have that point of view that we are making it all about race? I'm, I'm going to jump straight in. Um, I, I think there, there are two things that I would say. One is that um, to not be um, honest uh, and complete about history harms both black people and white people. And I think that that is a really important thing uh, to do. And I, I, you know, by choice, my focus has been on how, how does this play out within the black community? That's what I've chosen to do. Um, and I'm really interested and focused on how that, how how we have conversations about recognizing each other, recognizing ourselves. Um, and I think the you know my my approach to this, in some senses, is actually really quite simplistic. Which is basically, I stay in my lane. My job is to tell my story. That's that's my that that's my responsibility. I don't expect it to be anybody else's responsibility. So I need, in order to do that, I need to understand it. I need to be honest about it, the warts and all, and I need to be prepared to say it from a position of authenticity and humility in terms of what it is that that we have, 
what the collective we have been through, where my part of it is, and also doing that with the recognition of that next stage, that next community, that next generation, and the importance of actually them having uh, information about who they are, the value that they bring, that they bring, the uh, successes that they've had, uh, and that's for me what I do within any opportunity to talk about black history. Um, I can often talk about a personal story, but I know by default, I'm often talking about a collective experience that many of us have had. Yeah, I think um, picking up on what, what David is, is saying, it's, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a corporate environment, when you're taking people, you have to take people with you on this, on this journey to improve DI, etc. Uh, and often, often that's a kind of that's a slow process and a slower process than people would like. Um, however, there are some things that you just have to be pretty firm and honest about. Uh, and you know, we, we've seen this kind of rhetoric about being anti woke or woke or this that, and the other. You know, uh, I actually personally have very little time for it, right? this kind of anti-woke sentiment. Well, um, yeah, uh, uh, okay. You know, feel free to, to feel how you want to feel. Um, but I'm going to deal with the reality of the situation. And the reality of the situation is um, we do not live in a meritocracy, despite um, that overwhelmingly in the UK being the kind of what's played into the cultural consciousness. Um, there's very little evidence whether you look at education, housing, employment, health, etc., that says um, uh, black people have uh, equitable outcomes. So is it not incumbent upon us to do something about that? You know, everybody benefits when everybody does better. When, when certain groups of people do not do better, it doesn't help the cohesion of society as a, 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 as a whole. And you know, one of the things I often hear because of the work Lloyds is doing on the research with transatlantic slavery is kind of, well, what's this got to do with us? It was, it was hundreds of years ago. We're, we're not to blame. Um, nobody is, that's not what anybody is saying. You know? uh, what happened uh, hundreds of years before uh, anyone was born um, isn't the right responsibility of that person. But it is their responsibility to acknowledge that things are still not right today. And they can play an active part in in changing that. And I saw a comment um, uh, in the channel about how do you be a good ally? You know, for me, it's quite easy. You know, first of all, to be a good ally, it's something active, right? It's not just showing up to an event. It's it's something active, right? Um, you have to be willing to uh, stand up and be be counted. You have to be willing to be a sponsor uh, for your your black colleagues or black family or, or people in, in the community. And the third important thing is no one's important, so just ask. You know, no one's perfect, so just ask. If you get something wrong, there's not there's, there's not going to there's not going to be a huge march to tell you got something wrong. But learn, learn, learn how people want to be described. Learn how people want to be supported. Learn. Um, when they need assistance and, and, and when it's best to, to step back. Those are the things that an ally does. And in a corporate environment, you know, I talk to senior leaders and others, uh, you know, role modeling is important. You know, showing up, putting your face to it is important. But what I need more from you than anything else is I need, I need sponsorship and advocacy. So when the difficult conversations are having in the room, we're looking at the evidence. We're not looking at some subjective feeling. We're looking at the we're looking at the evidence. Um, when opportunities for informal development come up, you know, we want you to be actively considering the broadest range of people, not just uh, those who are most like you or, or who you trust a lot because you spend more time socializing. So, um, to anyone who's in the anti woke brigade, and look, uh, if diversity is done badly, it's a waste of money. If it's done well, um, it is an advocate for positive change, whether that be community relations or the bottom line of an organization or, or community coherence. Uh, and 
you know, if you don't know that, um, if you don't know that yet, or you can't figure that out with a bit of reading and a bit of learning, I suspect you're going to find out in the end anyway. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you so much, Kashim, as well. Um, really powerful points made here. Um, and it's shocking, but we actually have five minutes left in the show, um, in our conversation today. And um, we've had a few questions from the audience, so I do want to be able to um, share some of those with our panel and, and hear their thoughts. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to sh send them through still. If we don't get to answer them, we'll be sure to reach back out to you. You'll also see a link being shared in the chat, um, just a little survey so we can understand how you found the conversation that we had today. Um, and we'll be looking forward to kind of hearing your thoughts and feedback. So please do make sure that you give that a little go. The first question from the audience is for Kamali. Um, Kamali, the question's asked, what can we as listeners and supporters do to help uplift and advocate for the Black Music Coalition and Black artists? Thank you. Oh, thank you for that question. Um, I think it ties into uh, what Mark was touching on um, around allyship. I think it's something that, especially since 2020, lots of people want to know how to be better allies and what that looks like. And I think uh, it's, it really comes down to challenging your own comfort sometimes and those of, and that of those around you. And I think the way this whole system is, and, and racism as a construct, it, it's made to make everything about race, just to touch back on your last question as well. And so that isn't something that black people began. So for me, I think it's really important to in, it can be small ways, it may seem small, but it's a big deal if, you know, you're in the office and you see, you know, one of your co your black colleagues or non, non white colleagues being overlooked or mocked even, or, you know, can be microaggressions like, you know, their name being mispronounced constantly despite being corrected. Small things that actually really undermine a person over, a, especially in a working environment over the course of you know, they're working day, week, month, years. And I think it's it, it's more damaging than people like to, to, to admit. And I think even if that's how you show up for your non-white counterparts at work or when you're out and about, um, you know, attending things like this, asking questions and, and, and really challenging yourself. Um, the Black Music Coalition, in regards to that, um, we are about to open membership um, which is a great way to, you know, financially support the cause. Um, if you don't want to sign up for membership yourself, there's also the option to sponsor someone that you know that will be able to access, um, you know, the services and partnerships that we're providing. Um, and we also uh, take donations. We also have a resource pack. So if there's any businesses, um, you know, in the audience who would like to become better at allyship and diversity and inclusion for their black members of staff feel free to check out our website um to find out a little bit more about that um and yeah so i think it i think it's that it's all around there's lots of ways to do it um but i think honestly it, it comes down to stepping outside your comfort zone um and that is easier said than done but it's actually super easy and when you look at everyone as a human being i think it makes it even easier thank you kamali I'll turn quickly with one more question to Danny. The question is, hello, Danny, you mentioned stories of building Panama Canal. Um, like many industries, those who create the product don't get the recognition that brands achieve coffee, fast fashion, et cetera. Kashane shared about the power of celebrating together in adversity. How can we access these nuggets of joy and share them as allies? And this is a question from Melanie. <laughs> So I, my immediate response to that is it involves a lot of reading. I think one of the things that as a community, no, I'm not going to speak to everyone. One of the things that I get a little bit fed up of is um, having to, uh, people turning to me and expecting me to have all the answers. I, I have a lot of my personal history in the family. I'm, I'm someone who has sort of absorbed a lot of the history and a lot of the stories from my elders. Um, because I've sat and listened. Um, but I do find that sometimes I get prodded quite a lot 
um, you know, a, a, about the history of my people. And it's available. I think I was very lucky growing up um, to have my parents' library. <laughs> so when they were teaching me about the Atlantic slave trade, I said, no, 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 no. Uh, I've got a lot of other resources here and I'm, I'm going to learn a lot more and, and, and what, what really went on there. I was mm. a very curious mind and I would implore anybody who's interested in these stories that aren't told to get curious and to get um, to grips with their, you know, the resources available to them. So find your local black owned bookshop, um, you know, speak to black scholars um, and, and contact them for the, for the works that they've written um, on particular areas that you're, that you're interested in. I think that, that really needs to happen. Um, less leaning on um, the black community to explain to you um, because it can be quite painful for us and more, more curiosity as to what resources are already out there. Amazing. Thank you so much, Danielle. And, and thank you so much to um, all of our panel, um, because this is all that we have time for. But you've been a fantastic audience. This has been an incredible panel. And I myself have, have been representing the wonderful equality leaders who worked to ensure that diversity, equity and inclusion are part of your everyday. Our mission is to support businesses in delivering impactful DEI outcomes critical to their sustainable and commercial success. We're led by evidence based insights to focus on building thriving futures for the communities we live in, work with, and serve. If you're interested in finding out more or would like to talk to me or any of the team, please reach out and don't be shy. You'll find all of our panelists on LinkedIn. So be sure to get their names down. Um, I'm sure that they'll love hearing from you and hearing what you found about the session. So please do so. But for now, it's time to say goodbye and to wish you a Black History Month that is filled with discovery and learning. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.